guess Frank didn't make it. <laughs> He's probably trying to sell. I'm not even going to worry about him. He'll, he'll have a real good excuse. Uh, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the Hudson Institute. My name is Dan McKibrigan, Vice President for Government Relations at Hudson. It is a true honor today to host author Keith Hardage Lee and Andrea Rander to discuss Heath's extraordinary book, The League of Wives, The Untold Story of the Woman of the Women Who Took on the United States Government to Bring Their Husbands Home from Vietnam, published this year by St. Martin's Press. Heath holds a BA from Davidson College and an MA from the University of Virginia. She is an independent historian and biographer. Potomac Books published Heath's prize-winning book, Winnie Davis, Daughter of the Lost Cause, in 2014. Heath was the 2017 Robert J. Dole Curatorial Fellow in her exhibition entitled The League of Wise, Vietnam POW, MIA Advocates and Allies, premiered at the Dole Institute of Politics in 2017. The exhibit is currently traveling to museum venues across the United States through 2020, including the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. I should also note that actor Reese Witherspoon and a production company Hello Sunshine have optioned the League of Wise for a feature film, and Heath has promised that we're all invited to the premiere in Hollywood, so Absolutely. keep that in mind. Sure. <laughs> uh, Andrea Rander was raised in New York City. She attended Hunter College in the University of Maryland, where she obtained a degree in behavioral sciences. Andrea moved to Baltimore after marrying Donald Rander and took a position in the Department of Social Work, Baltimore City Hospitals, and later worked in the Department of Psychiatry. Andrea's husband was declared missing in action on February 3, 1968, soon after U.S. Army Sergeant Rander was reported held in captivity in South Vietnam. He was eventually moved to the notorious Hanoi Hilton prison camp, where he remained for five years. In August 1969, Andrea was asked to be on the founding board of the National League of Families for American Prisoners in Missing in Southeast Asia. She and her fellow POW MIAYs met on a regular basis with senior officials of the United States government and many others to publicize and seek humane treatment of the prisoners. Sergeant Rander was released from captivity on March 27, 1973. Andrea is currently a Red Cross volunteer at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and a docent at the National Museum of Health and Medicine, where she has received several awards for her volunteer work from the museum and from President Obama. Andrea has two daughters and four grandchildren. Heath will now give a, a slide presentation, um, then we'll sit down and do a few questions and then, and then throw it out into the audience. Um, so again, um, thank you for coming, and Heath will uh, take it from here. Good afternoon. Nice to see a lot of young people here as well. This is a story you need to know, and you probably don't know yet, but you will. So. Thank you also, Dan, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Andrea, for being here today to help us explain this from a first-person perspective. Since we do have a lot of young people here, we'll get the slide thing up. And I will start by talking, doing a mini refresher course on Vietnam for those who do know about it. And then for those who don't, this will be perhaps your first introduction to that. So. The American War in Vietnam was not the first. Prior to our US involvement, Vietnam was a French colony. The Vietnamese fought very hard for their independence, and the French lost in a bloody defeat at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954. The Geneva Conference of 1954, as you see here, split Vietnam along the 17th parallel into the north and the south. Ho Chi Minh was the communist leader in the North. The French-educated Emperor Bao controlled the South. The South wanted closer ties with the U.S. and the West. By 55, Bao is out. Ngo Dinh Diem takes over. He is our man in the South until he is assassinated with U.S. complicity in 1963. He is gone when he is no longer serving our ends. President Eisenhower's domino theory held that if one country fell to communism, so might others around it. So ZM was our hedge against communism in Southeast Asia during this time period. JFK would send US advisors to Vietnam in the 1960s, in the early 60s, 
But then he is assassinated just months after our former ally, Zien, is assassinated also. Lyndon Johnson takes over as president after JFK is assassinated. And by August of 1964, the US will enter the Vietnam conflict in earnest. My book focuses mostly, but not exclusively, on those involved in the air war over Vietnam, mostly pilots, Air Force or Navy, who are shot down and become prisoners of war or missing in action. Their wives and families on the home front are the ones that must take charge to try to save the prisoners, account for the missing, and deal with the political fallout at home. I am a museum curator as well as a writer and a historian, so I am often inspired by artifacts that I find during my research in my books and, of course, in my exhibits. So this is one of the first artifacts that came across my desk, protocol guides. This is the Navy Wife, a protocol guide put out by the military starting right after World War II. These were written by military wives for military wives, and they're very revealing about military culture of the times. I'm focusing on the 60s and 70s in this book, so I really looked at the 60s guides. Uh, they have lots of good practical advice about running a military household, deployments, life on a military base, but they are also filled with lots of not so subtle social prescriptions for military wives and their families. Her job was to help him, the servicemen at this point in the 60s and the 70s, do his job. That was really should be her only job was the implication in the protocol guides. But otherwise, she needed to stay out of the way, avoid making a fuss, and stay in her regulated place. As many um, military folks have told me, the saying at the time was, if the military wanted you to have a wife or children, they would have issued you them. So that's kind of the attitude that we're, we are starting this story around. Sybil and Jim Stockdale. They are at the very center of this story. Jim, originally from Illinois, attended the US Naval Academy. He was uh, ambitious, climbing the fighter pilot ranks. Sybil, his wife, who is truly the center star of the story, was highly educated, a Connecticut native. She loved, though, being a mom to their four children, all boys, and a Navy wife. She was very happy in this role when we encountered them in the mid-50s. So I call them in the book the ideal fighter pilot and ideal fighter pilot's wife. Jim, though, is shot down September 9th of 1965 after he is deployed to Vietnam as a fighter pilot. He will be the highest ranking naval POW in the Hanoi Hilton. This makes Sybil automatically the highest ranking, and I say ranking in air quotes, Navy wife on the home front in Coronado, California, where she and Jim are based. Her status is based on his rank. I don't come from a military background, so it took me a while to understand the military hierarchy with spouses at the time, and still somewhat today, translates over to the spouse. So that was kind of a learning curve for me, learning about that. So this hierarchy dictated that Sybil would take over in shepherding the other POW MIA wives in the San Diego area where she was based. It was just an automatic default mechanism. Sybil will become the leader of the POW MIA movement and the first, at first on the West Coast and later nationally when this spreads across the country. Next, we're going to take a look at a video about Jeremiah Denton. And before we start the video, I'll just give you a quick background. Jeremiah Denton was the second highest ranking naval POW in Vietnam. This was decided, by the way, because he was also at the Naval Academy with Jim Stockdale, class of 47. Jerry's grade point average was two tenths of a point lower. So that's how it was decided about the hierarchy, which I always thought was kind of interesting. So Jerry is shot down a couple of months, actually, before Jim Stockdale. He's also in the Hanoi Hilton. And the video you're going to see is the first indication that naval intelligence received about the torture that was going on in Vietnam, which the North Vietnamese were denying, denying, 
um, saying they were obeying the Geneva Conventions of War, which they were not. Um, so this shows you how Jeremiah Denton is going to turn the tables on his interrogators uh, and the Japanese interviewer interviewing him for what the North Vietnamese were making this uh, sort of interview, putting it together as a propaganda film. And Denton turns the tables on them. So we'll let you see this very short video so you can see what happens. I get uh, adequate food and adequate clothing and medical care when I require it. How do you think about uh, the uh, about so-called Vietnamese law? How do you think that's going to happen? Well, I don't know what uh, is happening, but uh, whatever the position of my government is, I support it fully. Mm -hmm. Whatever the position of my government is, I believe in it. Yes, sir. I am a member of that government. So this is pretty chilling to watch because what he's saying, they want him to sort of betray his government and say he supports the North Vietnamese and communism. And he, I have a great scene in the book where he tells one of his friends he's going to go to this interview and blow it wide open. He's going to say he supports his own government and at the same time comes up with the brilliant idea to blink torture in Morse code. Um, the Atlantic asked me a couple of months ago, what is the most courageous act in history? Well, that is an impossible question. But I said, from my point of view, this is one thing that qualifies. He knew if they figured it out, he'd be executed. But he does that to signal that the other prisoners are being, and of course he himself, are being tortured. So this is the first indication that naval intelligence gets about this going on. And the wives will support this later with the coding that they do, and I'll tell you about that shortly. But first, we need to talk about Lyndon Johnson and his involvement in the war. After JFK is assassinated in 63, of course, LBJ, the vice president, takes over. His great society programs, such as the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and Head Start, are all great, though I'll point out mostly Kennedy legislation that he pushes through. However, foreign policy might not be his strong point, particularly with Vietnam. The Vietnam War is his waterloo. LBJ is shown here during a short stopover on North Island Naval Base in Coronado. He's with Sybil Stockdale. He's right across from him. Several other POW wives. Um, this was just a photo op. He really would not speak to the wives privately or in groups or individually. So this is a pretty unusual photo. When I went to the LBJ library to ask for a grant to come do research, they said, don't bother, because he had no conversations with the wives, would not meet with them, which I found shocking. So I, needless to say, I didn't waste my time going there for this particular project. Um, so an unusual picture. Sybil in her diary said, he stopped to shake our hand and say, how do you do? And that was it. He moves on after that. He saw these women, the POW MIA wives, as a liability, and the POW MIA issue as something to be swept under the rug. Vietnam was such an unpopular war, this didn't feed his ends of being reelected. He also enforced something called the keep quiet policy, which was not LBJ's policy, this had always been the policy with prisoners in previous wars that the government wanted the women, the family members as well, to keep quiet, to not talk about the prisoner experience. Now, this in previous wars made a little more sense because prisoners were generally not held for long periods of time. But as they would find, Vietnam was a whole different war. These prisoners were held for up to eight years. The keep quiet policy was untenable, impossible. There was no way that this could last, and the wives knew this pretty quickly. But under LBJ, this was enforced with an iron hand with the help of Averill Harriman, who was the POW MIA ambassador. Harriman was never in the military, did not understand the military code of conduct, and he actively covered up the POW MIA torture for years. In digging in Harriman's uh, meeting notes, I found a phrase where he said, quote, what good would it do for the American public to know about the torture, which is unbelievable and turned out to be 
absolutely the wrong call, and I'll talk about why in a few minutes. So Sybil and the roses. The roses are an important symbol here. By fall of 1966, Sybil is learning to code secret letters to her husband Jim in prison under the tutelage of Bob Burroughs, a very key figure in this book. He is a naval intelligence officer and one of the few that supports these women in their endeavors to get their husband out. Jim would soon figure out that when Sybil sent a letter accompanied by a photo of roses, it signaled a coded letter. Not all the letters were coded, but that was a very simple way to let him know that, and he would learn that over time. A coded letter from Sybil would be written on invisible carbon paper, and he would soak it for a message. Jim could then dry the letter out and write back between the lines. The way that she trained him to figure the soaking part out is she sent a photo along with this Rose's photo, the first one, sent an additional photo of a woman that looked like Jim's mother, but he would know it was not his mother. And this woman was in the ocean near uh, Coronado swimming, and his mother would never, ever have done that. So she knew he would know that. And underneath the photo, she wrote, all your mother needs is a good soak. So Jim had a lot of alone time to figure things out. It didn't take him long. He soaked it and the messages come up. It's very James Bond, like 60s James Bond. Very cool stuff. Now, again, very low tech. Later in the war, it becomes a little more high tech. But at this point, it's pretty basic. A lot of double speak, things like that. But he quickly gets the message. And other POW wives like Jerry Denton's wife, Jane, are all beginning to code with Bob Burroughs' help. And here we have the lovely Andrea Rander, who is here with us today, who has not aged one bit. She doesn't. She has amazing genes, so she is just as beautiful today. But this is a picture of her from the 1960s, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about Andrea and not embarrass her too much. So in 1968, Baltimore Army wife Andrea Rander joins Sybil Stockdale, Jane Denton, and the other POW MIA wives in their terrible situation after her husband, Donald Rander, is captured in the Vietnamese city of Hue during the Tet Offensive. Um, Andre, who is obviously here with us today, was working full time at that point, and she had two little girls, Lisa and Paige, to raise when Don was shot down. Like Sybil, she quickly became a POW MIA activist, and she would become the only African American on the National League's founding board in 1969. And we'll talk a little later with Andrea in, in person about her own experiences. And here you see Andrea right to the right of Richard Nixon, Sybil to the left with other POW MIA wives. And this is what I call the go public slide. In 1968, LBJ had decided not to run for president. Vietnam had nailed his political coffin shut. Enter Republican candidate Richard Nixon, who wins the election. Unlike LBJ, President Nixon responded very quickly to the League lobby, now called the National League of Families for American Prisoners and Missing in Action in Southeast Asia. So it has morphed from a West Coast-based organization and spread all over the country, and everyone has joined together under Sybil's leadership. She will be the national, the first national coordinator of the National League. In Sybil's diary, she wrote, quote, dark, dark days in the Johnson administration, bright, sunny days under Nixon, which sounds kind of funny considering some other things, but Nixon to this community is a major hero, and you will see why as we go on. So this is the Go Public press conference that Nixon held at the White House on December 12th of 1969 with these women who are all leaders in the National League. Now, the U.S. administration sees the women as assets, not as liabilities. Nixon is much smarter than LBJ in this particular instance. He lends them real support. His political goals align with these women. Of course, these are conservative military wives, but remember, they've totally stepped out of line. So it's an interesting dichotomy what's going on there. But the Nixon administration from the get-go supports them, knows about them from Ronald Reagan, the governor of California, who's put in a good word for them, 
and it goes from there in a very positive way, very unlike LBJ in Keep Quiet. Now, uh, they have fully gone public with the story not only of the Geneva Conventions of War not being observed. Um, Sybil has gone public in 1968 in the San Diego Union paper about that. Now we're actually talking about the torture more openly, and the National League is having its first big national convention. So in this slide, you see Sybil Stockdale, the League's national coordinator, Ross Perot, the Texas billionaire, and Senator Bob Dole, who I've worked with extensively on curating an exhibit about the League of Wives with all the artifacts that came to me. Um, so this is on May 1st, 1970, press conference right before the National League's huge first convention. Ross Perot, you might know, died recently. He was a huge supporter of these POW MIA wives and their families. He spent millions of dollars flying them to all over uh, the country, also to Europe, to confront the North Vietnamese at their consulates, trying to get information about the POW's whereabouts and the MIA's uh, and accounting for them. So he was a huge supporter of these women throughout and even after this conflict was over. And of course, Bob Dole, Senator Bob Dole, at this point is a young Kansas senator, also a war veteran, very most Folks here I bet know he was a combat veteran, severely wounded in World War II, always supported veterans, those with disabilities. So the POWs were a natural fit for him. He supported this community from the beginning when nobody else in Congress would. One of the first interviews I did with Senator Joel, he said in 1969, even by that time, quote, no one even knew what a POW or an MI was. That's how bad it was in terms of people knowing about it, people supporting it. It was that issue that LBJ kept trying to sweep under the rug, but Dole determined he was going to help the women get the word out, and he did that very successfully with them. Here we have, of course, Senator John McCain, who is probably the POW might know the best from history. Finally, the war is over. On January 27th, 1973, the peace treaty is signed with North Vietnam, which thanks to the women of the National League includes the return of the POWs and the best possible accounting of the missing in action. And here we see future Arizona Senator John McCain among the returned POWs. This is right uh, before the big White House gala for the POWs I'll tell you about next. He was shot down on October 26, 1967. He was severely injured and came very close to dying in prison due to botched medical care he received from the North Vietnamese or didn't receive. Eventually, he recovers, and he refuses to take early release even when it's offered to him. He is severely tortured, still on crutches when he returns home. Um, due to the torture he had endured in prison, McCain could never again raise his hands above his head and always walked with a slight limp. So he becomes very well known for this um, even before his political career gets into high gear. And here is the gala that I mentioned earlier. The same day as the McCain photo was taken you just saw, on May 24th of 1973, President and Mrs. Nixon hosted an evening gala at the White House for the returned POWs and their female guests. A total of 1,300 attended. It is still, to this day, the largest dinner ever held at the White House, held on the South Lawn under tents. Torrential rain that day, mud, everyone's heels were stuck in the mud. Nobody cared. You know, this was such a joyous occasion. And you had movie stars like John Wayne, there entertainers like Bob Hope and Sammy Davis, politicians like Secretary of State and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, who, by the way, brought a Playboy bunny as his date to this. <laughs> I actually asked him about that, and he didn't confirm or deny, but he did. But he was covered in lipstick that night, not from the Playboy Bunny, I suppose, but from the POW MIA wives who were thanking him profusely for helping negotiate this treaty and end the war. The Watergate scandal you may have heard of is looming in the background. 
But President Nixon, and I've watched all these tapes a million times of this, of this gala, he seems genuinely thrilled on this evening, elated to bring the men home. He toasts not to the returned POWs, but to their wives, mothers, and sisters, calling them, quote, the bravest and most magnificent women I have ever met. Gentlemen to the first ladies of America, the first ladies, and that is who I dedicated my book to. Just one more slide to wrap this up. So Dan mentioned this has been optioned for a film with Reese Witherspoon, which is moving along, so hopefully that will get made at some point. The Hollywood ending to this story could be that of the White House Scala, the neat, happy, glamorous ending that moviegoers would love. However, that would not be the correct ending. If I have anything to do with it, it will not be the ending because the POW MI saga does not end here. The reality is many of those MIAs have never returned home, not even their remains. As of July 2019, 1,587 MIAs are still unaccounted for. The MIA wives and families are left to pick up the pieces. Many who did return, like Andrea's husband, Don, suffered from severe PTSD. So there isn't a happy, neat Hollywood ending for so many people. But the takeaways to wrap it up regarding the brave women like Andrea and Sybil, Jane Denton, and others who formed and led the National League of Families are this. Sybil, Andrea, and the League of Wives empowered themselves to change history. They rejected the keep quiet policy as outdated and ineffective. They went public, saving POW lives, helping to stop POW torture and improving prisoner conditions. And I know this from no less of a source than Senator John McCain, who told me when I interviewed him in 2016 that by 1969, the torture had mostly stopped. He was moved from solitary to a cell with 25 other prisoners. He got better food, better medical treatment, more mail. All of this happened immediately. The quote from McCain, it was like a light switch going on. It was not gradual. McCain attributed these drastic changes in part to the death of Ho Chi Minh, the communist leader, but even more so to the advocacy of the National League, which he felt had saved POW lives. Senator McCain also agreed with me heartily that the keep quiet policy was the wrong call. And finally, these brave POW MIA wives changed the role of military spouses forever. The women evolved from play by the rules, stay at home wives to tireless human rights activists and advocates who demanded accountability, not only from the North Vietnamese, but also from those in their own United States government. So we will move now, I think, to a little panel discussion. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you. That was very, very uh, sure. uh, moving. And uh, I think for probably a lot of people here, the first time they kind of got a full picture of, of other, the other things that are going on behind the scenes that no one knows about. And thank goodness for your book. This would be lost to history largely. Um, so thank you. And Andrea, thank you very much for joining us. Um, what I thought I would do is just ask just a few questions and then um, throw it uh, open to the audience um, and uh, let's see where we go. Um, the first one is, um, Andrea, uh, the, could you walk through when you first heard about your husband's capture and then, and then the, the issues you immediately faced knowing that that was the case? Yes. It was really dramatic. I'm sitting in my office in the psychiatry department, which I ended up really needing after a while. <laughs> and I was called to the director's office and standing outside on the periphery were green uniforms. And I had no clue. I didn't want to think that anything was wrong, but when I saw the uniforms, the reality tried to set in. And I went in, 
sat down and got the news that my husband was missing in action and they didn't have any further information to give me at the time, but they would try to keep me posted as much as they possibly could as word got out. And there was a lot of insurgency at the time, and so he was just back track a little bit. He was captured during um, the, the way, if you've heard of way Vietnam, mm -hmm. and that was in 1968. So he was in the city of way. And that's where all of the insurgency was going at the time. So that was the beginning and the notice that I received. And after that, it was just wait and see if I get any further word. And it was a couple of months, seemed like it was longer, and it may have been before I heard that he had been captured. And the way that um, the information flowed through the military was that one other person that he was with managed to escape. So um, they, he was able to give the information that Donald had actually been captured. And Donald was in the military intelligence area of, arm, of the Army, and he was living in a home in the city of Way with four other gentlemen, and they were all in military intelligence. So this is, um, that was really the seriousness of his capture. Well, the, um, so, so there are a lot of just, uh, the book is really fascinating, and there are a lot of individual stories um, that, that are, uh, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't know, had no idea about, but also, um, were really rich in the, the people that you 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 met. Um, one in particular, yeah, the 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 in encounter with Madame Bin, who at the time was in the political leadership of the Viet Cong, and you went over to Paris with Ross yes. Perot to meet with um, the the leadership um, um, uh, of the of uh, the insurgency, but also the, the government in the north um, regarding the POWs and. You want to tell uh, kind of how that how that came about, and it must yes. have been surreal, um, and uh, you know just your perspective looking back on it now. Yes, exactly. It was surreal, and actually, this was the second trip that I took to Paris on behalf of the wives and and the husbands that we were trying to get released. And so the strategy was because Madame Bin, being a representative of the Vietnamese delegation maybe there would be some compassion that would be shown if one military wife whose husband had been captured in the south of Vietnam would see Mrs. Bin, or she would al allow me to be seen by Mrs. Bin, by herself rather, and perhaps maybe we could get somewhere a little bit faster than the way things were, were being revealed. Well, I stood at the gate, and somewhere in history there's a picture of me standing solo at the gate trying to get in to see Mrs. Bin, and it didn't happen. So that was really devastating and very disappointing to me at the time. But it was an effort that was made, and even though it, it was disappointing, um, it was part of what we needed to do. I think this is a, a good jumping off point um, in terms of mm -hmm. that, that meeting in, in Paris, but also how then the anti-war movement comes into, yes. into this equation with right. being, having to find a, a way to, to, to reach out to the leadership in Hanoi um, who would not uh, at all interact with the US government, State Department or the Defense Department. Um, and you can speak a little bit of how the Cora Weiss and David Dillinger and all the other anti-war activists, uh, Tom Hayden, how, how that group and those groups were, were, were engaged um, um, uh, at the time to, to, you know, to, to, to help the, the, the prisoners out, but at the same time knowing that the government of Hanoi is using those, sort of, sort of those groups and 
uh, the wise for their own propaganda purposes. Mm -hmm. um, that, I, that's yeah. a really interesting uh, bit in the book that um, I don't think many know about. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the background. And Andre, I believe, only got, did you just get one letter from Don the whole time? None. None I never at all. heard of, from him so you, until she, he was released. You didn't wow. quite experience the Cora Weiss pressure, I think, that some did. But I'm sure you were aware of her and yes. what she was doing. Yes, I got invited to go to the rallies, and oh. I just couldn't do it. That. Uh, and yes, I'll explain a bit about the rallies and the peace activists. So there is a whole spectrum of peace activists, of course, just like today, some with better goals than others, perhaps. But Cora Weiss was the head of something called Calliophan. And this was the Committee of Liaison for Servicemen Missing and Lost in Southeast Asia. They had lots of long acronyms in this time period to keep up with. But her group was there because during the Nixon administration at this time, the communist government had shut down all mail in and out of Hanoi. They were not allowing anything. So the only way that mail got in and out at this point, before it had been sporadic, now it was totally shut down, was Cora Weiss, the head of this peace group, was the facilitator for mail and also for early releases for prisoners of war, which, by the way, was not allowed by the military code of conduct. That's why McCain refuses that release. So Cora and her group are really working for the communists. They are supporting those goals, not supporting the goals of our government. And the wives and the POWs and MIAs are pawns in this game. And Cora's group will not really help the POW MIA wives unless she can give their propaganda to them. She can invite them to rallies and give their phone numbers out and their names out. She will also come home and give television conferences where she announces POWs or killed in action, missing in action, without government approval, without telling the wives. She'll just give a conference and say, this is the list. So she's really working kind of outside our laws to lobby for the communist cause. So many people have asked me, well, what about Jane Fonda? Well, Jane Fonda is, is a small fish in this picture. Cora Weiss is the big player in terms of the supporting the communists, and I would not even put her in the peace activist category. It's a very political game, and she is really on that side, so the wives are trapped in the middle. What the wives told me, though, which I thought was so interesting, many of them, Louise Mulligan being the one I remember the best, a Virginia Beach activist, her quote was, I would do a deal with the devil if it would bring my husband home. And that's how they see Cora Weiss and the peace activists as a whole, as they're the devil. War makes for strange bedfellows. They work together. They get the mail through. And even Bob Burroughs, the naval intelligence officer, is instructing the women to work with the peace activists. And the part I thought was so interesting is the peace activists are unknowingly carrying coded letters into the prisoners of war. So they use each other for different political ends. But unfortunately, the wives and the prisoners are caught in the middle of this very political football game. So that's kind of the context. Um, I'll just do one more question, and then, then we can go to Q&A. Um, you know, how, how would you, um, so we can for you, Andrea, in terms of the, how was the press became, uh, when you read the book, it's clear that the press at that point becomes a pretty big ally to the wives mm -hmm. and to kind of getting Congress to wake up, um, with, you know, and Bob Dole and, um, and, and others are involved um, with, with the media. Um, what, how was the media used, and was it something that was, you know, you go from very private, Navy, uh, you know, you don't talk about anything to the next thing, you know, cameras and you know, you're in Paris and you're coming to Washington. Um, how, was, how was that to navigate and, and to make sense of it all at the That's time? A very good question. Because actually, we thought the press were very annoying in the beginning yeah. <laughs> until we knew what they could do and what, what they were trying to do and how open they, they made things more open and creative. And creative, I, I can describe to you a particular piece of um, publicity that was was done, and it was a um, a panel that was created with my picture on it, and they asked me could they use this picture to put in 
to the New York City subways. And I thought, you know, being in New York, and maybe they thought this would bring some results and more people would be aware of the status of, of the wives. And so this long banner, if you ride the city um, subways in New York, you'll see all kinds of, of um, commercials and advertisements. And there was my picture all over New York City and mm. every subway, it seemed like, until I decided I wasn't going to ride the subways anymore when I went to visit my family. <laughs> I just couldn't. The picture wasn't all that great, I thought. You know, <laughs> you know what do they care? They, got, they were able to, to get the publicity that was needed. But they, this was really an asset, having um, the press and people coming at us, so to speak. But actually, they had, they had us in mind, and they really cared that the, the stories were, were growing and getting out to the public. And so after a while, it, it really was a part of us. And we got to know so many wonderful people, including um, a professor that was at Syracuse University, which is where one of my children went. And it ends up that she's in the class with one of the uh, columnists from a local newspaper who was now teaching at the university. And my daughter had her as an instructor. And they were able to discuss all the things that happened during that time and afterwards. But that was one press person we'll always remember. That's cool. Well, I think uh, we can, any questions, please, please, uh, please ask. Okay. Wait for the microphone. And uh, perfect, I'll read up here. Thank you. really made the wives be quiet. You couldn't ask any questions. They, they wanted to do everything and how you got past that. I know that was really difficult part. It was very difficult, particularly for my situation because it was like de double jeopardy. Um, and I'm still really curious about why we were told name, rank, and serial number. That was all we were allowed to say. And to me, that was giving out a lot of information. But that's what they wanted us to say, if any of press or anyone else came to ask us questions. Well, I think that um, because Don was in military intelligence, I couldn't say anything to anybody at any time. I really had to keep my mouth closed which was very difficult after a while, especially when you know, things were starting to open up. And it was very hard not to say anything. But the government was saying, don't open your mouth. Don't talk to anybody. Um, and of course, I'm getting word, your husband was in military intelligence. You are not to open. Don't say anything. So it was very difficult. But we did the best we could under the circumstances. And I would add, too, even when I was working on this book, so, um, I s had a number of wives who still would not talk, even though you know I write a lot in the book about going public and keeping quiet. But the, I think it's sort of a form of PTSD, because you had been told by the government over and over your husband could be executed, they could be tortured. I mean, there were legitimate reasons at first, but to go on for eight years was impossible. You had to do something different. And as McCain yes. confirmed, keep quiet was the wrong call. That was a Cold War deal. This was not right. for this new war where transparency, the media, it's such a precursor for today. That's what worked, the alliance with the media. So it, it's a very interesting um, phenomenon, I think, that you know some women still don't want to talk right. at all. And a lot of the POWs, uh, quite understandably, still don't want to talk about this part or the coding of the letters. I could only get a few women to talk on record about that. And on the other hand, when Donald was being investigated or queried in, while he was in prison, um, they would ask him, well, who do you work for? You know, they immediately thought he was a CIA person mm -hmm. being in the intelligence field. And actually, his, one of his roommates was a CIA um, investigator. Well, Donald would answer really 
it was funny to us later to hear his, his responses, but they would ask him questions. Who do you work for? Who, who's in charge of your organization? And he would just throw out names like Jackie Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> no. And he would name, of course, the New York Yankee names. And <laughs> they had no idea. Yeah. But, you know, that's how he opened up. And he had a very good sense of humor as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm a retired colonel. And I'm um, interested with regard to Cora Weiss, no relation, but um, she's a fascinating individual. And were you able to interview her as for part of this? Um, because I think the labeling, I get concerned when we start labeling, because it seems to me that there was one objective here. And I think you know you need multiple fronts and multiple tactics, and you need differing uh, you know, the entire spectrum. And so, and I think it's very interesting when I listen to the labeling, like how intense these feelings continue to be, mm -hmm. even though this is, you know, going on 50 some years, right? right? Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I will speak to one thing, Cora Weiss, I begged her for an interview. It would have added a lot to have had her voice on the record. So repeated requests for an interview and she said, the only thing you may write is I'm proud of my work here. The end would not allow me to do it. But I did, most of the sources I used came from her own archive, from the Swarthmore Peace Archive, which is, is her papers. And so a lot of the, the evidence about this came from her own records. And of course, all the interviews I did with the women. And you're right, it was extremely intense. And, and the, the peace activists like Cora, ended up unwittingly being a big help because of the courier system they had set up. I mean, no one else could get in. So I think you're right about the labeling. You have to be very careful about this. Um, and in the end, it, I, unknowingly, they really helped this effort by getting those letters through. So it's interesting how it all worked out. I'm David Burgess, an Air Force veteran. And uh, first, I just wanted to make a comment that I think that your book is brilliant. Oh, it really thanks. captures the personalities of the people at the time, the women, as well as um, the politicians and military. Thank you. Um, the, the question I have is what much more mundane, but at the time, it was, uh, for many of the families, a very serious issue of the financial burden that the women uh, and families faced when the, uh, especially when the uh, keep quiet policy was put in place. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah, so Do you want to speak question. to that first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, um, a lot of the military men who were captured had set aside um, an account so that money would not be spent out of that particular account. And we, if we were fortunate, we would get some of the salary, but it wasn't enough to cover the expenses as the expenses rose in the number of years that we were waiting. So all the women got together, and we pounded doors and walked around Washington, D.C., and we met with as many people as we could to do something about this, to release money that we could live from, or live off of, because things were really getting tight. And there were really very different situations that were going on. I tried to make a move from one area uh, to another area where I was living in Baltimore. And, um, and it involved money as well. But I went where I was told to go to ask for help to make a move, to, make, to help with the move. And as it turned out, there was no policy for POW wives or families to move. There was no money to move me. And I had a wonderful survivor assistant, as they were called at the time. They were assigned by the military 
to help the wives and the families. And he was really very good to deal with. He actually a, became a very good member of the family, so to speak. And so he went to bat for me, and finally I was able to make the move. But also, in the long run, we were, there was a bill that was passed, mm -hmm. and the wives were able to receive more benefits, more of the money that their husbands were making in absentia. And so we were able to try to survive off of that. But that was a really hard way to go. And fortunately, I was working, and that helped me a little bit. Well, and I'll add to that, um, I write a bit in the book, or I, I got very angry about the finances. So that comes across, I think, in the book. And this still continues today. I just read an op-ed about the widow's tax, which some of you may be familiar with um, for the MOAA, the Military Officers Association. This continues with veterans' families. It is so unfair. We should be giving these people everything. And these people had made almost the ultimate sacrifice. And the ultimate indignity was that there was a 10% savings plan set up for servicemen serving in combat zones. But guess what? The POWs and MIAs were not included in this plan. So this was prior, I believe, to your involvement. This happened a little bit earlier than 68. Sybil Stachel, of course, had a complete fit, as she should have, as did the other wives. They go to lobby for this, thinking it's probably an oversight. Oh no, the Comptroller General rules, they're still not allowed to because they are not contributing to the national economy, which is ridiculous. And when you read it, as Dan and I were talking, I just quote this letter in full, that's all you have to read. It's shocking. So even when confronted with that, the, the men were still, and the families who would have benefited were still not allowed into this plan. And it took these ladies more walking in Congress, more lobbying, more, you know, just saying the utter unfairness of this. In addition to that, they all had trouble drawing paychecks because, again, the women or the men don't have an address, so, so they can't cash the check. I mean, it was just like nobody had ever seen a prisoner situation before. And that's one thing I was not able to piece together is why, because we'd had the Korean War, World War I, World War II. We still had no policy, just like the move situation Andrea mentioned. There was no framework in place. So the wives today, the military wives today, the young ones I talk to, I tell them, you have these women to thank because they knocked on the doors and lobbied to get these things changed. And now it is different, but we're still facing issues like the widow's tax, which is very unfair to military families. It continues. We really still neglect these families in a a terrible way. Um, so that that is a big chapter in the book, is about the finances. I know we're coming up to our closing time, so I'm going to do moderator's prerogative and kind of ask this final question and uh, to both, mm -hmm. both Heath and Andrea. If there's one big thing you would like people to take away from both the book and, uh, and the times and the events you lived through, what would it be? That's a great question. Oh, thought that's a, one. a very thought-provoking question. Well, actually, I, I really want to say um, how strong my husband was during those years. He drew on a lot of strength that he said he was getting somehow from his family and from his faith, which also is what I drew from. But I think the fact that the war, was it worth it? That question always came up. And Donald was such a patriot, and he was really a true military man, and he said it was worth it. So I think this has made me more of a um, real, true American that it was, it was, I've always been, but just the fact that I hear the Star Spangled Banner, and I'm, I may be in my kitchen, I, I stand up. And so it has meant a whole lot more to me to have been the wife of a man who endured so much and suffered the after effects, um, and have the, ha I have the memories, the good memories, that we had after he came home. 
but he also had his difficulties. And it was hard for him in many situations to survive, even though he was outgoing and always seemed like he was having a good time. But he did have some PTSD to speak of. So I, I draw on the fact that he was so strong. It gave me more strength. It gave me much more to be able to deal with in life and to raise my two girls. Oh, this is a tough one. I mean, I, I would say two things. One, the big takeaway for me were these women, was just meeting them, being with them, seeing what they did to change military culture forever. This is one of the first times that we see, and I think the only time to date, that we see a group of women like this who are play by the rules, military wives, taught to stay in line, break out and just go for it, knowing, because they do the study of history, that communist regimes, keeping quiet is not going to work. Something our own government could not take the time to research and learn. So that was really inspiring to me. The second thing was the power of the group versus the individual. As individuals, these women, their voices were lost in the machinery of the government. Nobody was hearing them. But they very smartly you know, formed this grassroots organization under Sybil on the West Coast through newsletters. Remember, they don't have Twitter, Instagram, anything like that to hook up or WhatsApp. I mean, they can't use that. Newsletters, phone calls, personal meetings, they coalesce and it becomes this huge political lobby that is powerful, but they're still nonpartisan, which is also their strength. They don't take political sides. The goal is humanism, to get these guys out of a terrible situation. It is something the whole country can unite behind, and it works. So the power of the grassroots organization cannot be underestimated, and that was the other big takeaway for me um, from this. And there were so many, so many others. I was not political. I was not interested in politics. I was like, I'm bored by this. Now I am a junkie, like watching every <laughs> channel all the time, all three stations <laughs> trying to get the story. So it really activated me politically because I got so protective, I think, and outraged at what they had dealt with. I thought, I got to be, you know, wake up. This is really important. You need to participate. So it, it was a life-changing um, story for me just to be interviewing these women. Okay. Well, Andrea, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Keith, Dan. and thank everyone for coming. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.